And with this few words, please welcome Dr. Tim. Tim, you can start your presentation. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, hopefully, you can uh, hear me um, okay. And uh, and thank you very much for the introduction and uh, being with you um, today. So this presentation is going to be looking at the microbiological um, aspects of cleaning validation, but we'll also look at um, pharmaceutical water systems as well because um, that is important to understand how we generate and control water and we also need to consider um, biofilms as well. So these are the um, topics that I'm going to be focusing on. So a little bit about water system design and control, uh, biofilms, what cleaning is, then we'll have a look at cleaning validation and some of the GMPs around cleaning validation. Then we we'll look at the specific microbiological concerns, the microbiological risks, how we might put together a risk assessment for cleaning validation, um, look at the kind of microbiological tests that we need to perform and some of the limitations with those tests, and then finally, we'll have a look at why failures might happen in relation to um, cleaning validation. So let's begin with cleaning because that's the essential um, element and what we're looking at today. So um, cleaning can be defined in different ways. And in the context of cleaning validation, this is based on the level of residues that remain. And this is either those directly found on the equipment or those indirectly contained within the final rinse after the water has passed through or over the item of equipment that we intend to clean. And whether the residues remaining have been reduced to an acceptable level is based upon whatever predetermined acceptance criteria we put in place. And this acceptance criteria may well vary depending upon whether we're working in sterile or non-sterile manufacturing. And it's an important concept that the levels need to be reduced so to ensure that the next product manufactured is not compromised by waste or contamination from the previous product. So avoiding cross-contamination is of great importance. But as well as focusing on chemical residues, an additional and perhaps too often overlooked concern here are the levels of microbial fiber. Okay, so we're cleaning um, introduced. I think it's important to have a look at the different types of water that we find in pharmaceutical manufacturing environments because these all feed in to um, cleaning validation concerns. So let's begin with the incoming water. So this is what might be called potable water, mains water, towns water. And the normal requirement is that this incoming water is of drinking water quality. Um, and most regulations say that it, it needs to at least meet those minimum requirements to be fit to drink. Now, the use of this incoming water uh, in the actual manufacturing process is not permitted, but this is our feed water from which we will generate purified and water for injections. So it's important to make sure that this water does not have a presence of objectionable organisms. And generally, these objectionable organisms include uh, bacteria like Escherichia coli, different types of enterococci, organisms like Pseudomonas aeruginosa and other fecal coliforms. Um, now, the water company, the people providing the water, should be certifying the water. However, some pharmaceutical companies elect to carry out their own testing. And often they'll be looking for an indicator organism such as E. coli that will give an indication for the presence or absence of other 
fecal coliforms. Um, in terms of the overall um, buyer burden, well, often this is undertaken through the use of the heterotrophic plate count, and normally a limit of 500 CFU per milliliter or less is um, applied. And you will see variations in the species and in the microbial numbers. And that's because uh, this type of incoming water is considerably affected by um, seasonal fluctuations. So different weathers, different rainfall and so on will affect the water. Okay, so in terms of the core pharmaceutical water, then purified water, is a standard that you will find in the European pharmacopoeia and the United States pharmacopoeia. And there are a few differences in terms of the specifications. But um, purified water is intended for cleaning and it would be used in some non-sterile processing, such as the manufacture of tablets or capsules. And also it serves as the feed water for the generation of water for injection. And in most cases, purified water is generated through the use of reverse osmosis mechanisms. And the microbial action level is um, 100 colony forming units per milliliter, or where you would filter a larger sample, which is generally recommended um, it would equate to 10,000 colony forming units per 100 millilitres of water if you're applying the standard membrane filtration method. And then we have water for injections. And this is the highest quality of water used in the pharmaceutical industry. And again, these specifications are set up in, in, in the European pharmacopoeia and the United States pharmacopoeia. And unlike uh, purified water, the, the, the monographs are relatively the same. And this water can be prepared by reverse osmosis or distillation. My personal preference would be for distillation. I think it's better at endotoxin control. And a concern with reverse osmosis is if you get a biofilm buildup on the first side of the filter, because that can lead to endotoxin um, getting through under some circumstances. So WFI is used for formulation and uh, certain types of cleaning. And the within the European pharmacopoeia, the action level is 10 colony forming units per 100 millilitres. And there's a requirement that the <clears throat> excuse me, bacterial endotoxin level must be less than 0.25 endotoxin units per milliliter. So it's a high specification of water under strict microbiological control. And as I alluded to, there are different ways of generating water. And I spoke about um, reverse osmosis, which is the general method for um, producing purified water, and in some cases, uh, water for injection. So reverse osmosis units, and there's a very simple illustration on the slide, but where they use semi-permeable membranes and a substantial pressure differential to drive water through a membrane. And this is the process that is intended to achieve the required level of chemical, microbiological, and endotoxin quality. And they're obviously different design formats and sometimes there are multiple reverse osmosis units in sequence. And in terms of the general principles, reverse osmosis functions as a side excluding filter. And I said before, it's operating under these highly pressurized conditions. And under this mechanism, it should block 99.5% of endotoxins and ions and salts, but will allow water molecules to go through. But we do have this concern. If we do get a biofilm buildup, then that ability to exclude endotoxin does become compromised. Now with distillation, which is a method of 
producing water for injection. The key advantage is much more uh, validatable endotoxin removal. And distillation functions by turning water from a liquid vapor, uh, sorry, liquid into a vapor, and then from a vapor back into a liquid. And the endotoxin is removed by rapid boiling. So this um, causes the water molecules to evaporate, but the relatively larger lipopolysaccharide, which is the gram negative cell wall fragment that is endotoxin, remains behind. And good distillation units will be able to achieve between a 2.5 to 3 logarithmic reduction of endotoxin. Um, and you can then uh, assess this if you measure the endotoxin content in the feed water. So in order to produce water for injection of less than 0.25 endotoxin units per milliliter, you want to make sure that the feed water is no greater than 250 endotoxin units per milliliter. So there's an additional control measure to consider. So with these different uh, methods of water purification, um, there are three things that we're trying to do. So we're trying to reduce the level of chemical compounds in the water. And this is to prevent interactions with drug substances. So we're concerned with total organic carbon and conductivity levels. And ultimately there, obviously, we're, we've got a concern with the patient that we don't want toxins to be in that water. We're trying to reduce the microbial biburden. Uh, and not to have microorganisms that might then grow through further proliferation. And we're also wanting to remove endotoxins and prevent their further accumulation. And water systems require a high degree of maintenance. Uh, the purification pathway um, can create opportunities for development of particular environmental conditions that can lead to microbial niches developing and certainly where there's any chance of nutrients developing then we do have concerns so we need to maintain these water systems to avoid um, microbial contamination and this is all very important for when we come on to consider core cleaning validation because unless we start with water of the best quality then we are going to have um, considerable problems down the line. So now I'd like to look at water system contamination and this phenomena of biofilms. Now, all water systems will contain a level of microorganisms. But what is of concern are the numbers and frequency of microorganisms. And we also have additional concerns, particularly non-sterile manufacturing of microorganisms that might pose a specific concern to patients. So um, those of you who are involved in making inhalation products will know there's a considerable interest, particularly from regulators like FDA in Burkholdia cypatia which can cause considerable harm to patients, particularly um, cystic fibrosis patients. So there's a particular concern in ensuring that our water systems do not contain levels of Burkholdia cypatia that will cause patient harm. And if you're involved in ophthalmic products like eye drops, then um, if you had Pseudomonas aeruginosa in there, then that would be a considerable risk to the patient that could cause blindness. Now, contaminated water presents a concern, both because it is a growth source to aquatic organisms, so it's principally gram negatives, allowing them to survive and multiply. It can also be a vector for contamination because if we have poorly maintained water outlets, we have puddles of water on the floor, then also the generation of aerosols provides an effective vector for spreading contamination. So I just want to say a little bit more about um, Burkholdia cypatia, just because it is a very hot topic 
in the industry at the moment. So, but Coldis Apache is a complex of 30 related microorganisms. What they're related in the sense that they, they have a genetic similarity, and sometimes the term biovar is used to cluster these organisms. And it's important to note that the FDA has issued serious warnings to drug manufacturers about this complex of organisms. And if you look at the recall notices, you'll see that the, um, there have been a number of recalls in relation to this complex of organisms. So it's very important that um, there is good sanitary design of equipment, equipment cleaning, and to a degree, some level of environmental monitoring to make sure that our products are not at particular risk from these organisms. Okay, so let's now go on to the topic of biofilms, because biofilms will affect all systems and they will also considerably affect cleaning validation concerns, often where cleaning validation goes wrong, it's due to the presence of biofilms. So on the slide, a horrible picture of a pipe, an industrial pipe with a biofilm in it. And, you know, if, if you were to um, unscrew the pipes that are connected to um, any, any sinks, you might well see biofilms looking like that. But we don't want to have anything like that within the pharmaceutical centre. So a biofilm is a description for a group of microorganisms in which they're living in a community where they're bound to a surface. Essentially, the cells are sticking to the surface and sticking to each other. So microbial biofilms develop when microorganisms begin to adhere to a surface. And once they adhere to a surface, a great deal of these microorganisms can produce um, what are referred to as extracellular polymers. And these both facilitate the adhesion to the surface and they provide a structural matrix that gives a degree of protection. And how strong this adherence is, is the consequence of a balance of attractive and repulsive physicochemical interactions between the bacteria and the surface. And the primary issue is this generation of a slime-like material um, across the whole surface. Um, and this can be in pipe work, and often it recurs when it occurs when we have a slow flow rate through the system. And whilst the majority of bacteria are trapped within the biofilm, the biofilm will continually generate bacteria that are released as free floating individual cells. And also it might happen that parts of the biofilm will slough off in clumps. And the concern is we have a gradual um, build up of microbial contamination. But often the concern is this isn't consistent. And because microorganisms are not normally distributed, you may get cases where you get contamination, then it appears to go away, and then it appears again, and, and so on. And that's due to the um, particular skewed distribution of organisms in water. Um, so on the slide is, a, is an illustration of how a biofilm might form. So the biofilm develops because bacterial cells, as I said, once um, attracted to the surface, start secreting this extracellular polysaccharide. And microbiology refer to this as the glycolax. And what it is, is a hydrated polymeric slimy matrix. And what's also important is this enables the bacteria present to encapsulate themselves. And this encapsulation imparts a degree of resistance to chemical and heat treatments. And um, there's a beginning part in, in the steps on, on, on the screen where you can remove the cells. So it's what's called reversible attachment. But as time progresses, that moves to what's referred to as permanent attachment, 
when you get into permanent attachment, then the biofilm becomes very, very hard to remove. Um, and that's a process based on time, as the graph on the screen um, shows you. And there's different factors depending upon the material, what the pipe's made of, the uh, types of bacteria that are involved, the numbers that are present in the environment, the particular growth phase that these organisms are in. And generally, gram-negative bacteria form biofilms more readily. And that's because they tend to have, if you look at the bacterial cells, they have little attachments called fimbriae, which allow them to attach to surfaces more readily. Another factor is with surface charge. So the relative charge of the bacterial cell to the relative charge of the particular material that they might well attach to. Um, so this does create considerable um, problems. So often the worst cases of cleaning validation are the presence of biofilms. And we have this concern in water um, purification processes. And it can often be, uh, and there's a slight um, irony here, is that some of the stages of water purification can actually create some conditions that, although they're designed to reduce contamination, can also paradoxically promote biofilm formation. So an example of that is um, in-depth filtration through a matrix. And here, as water percolates through the filter. Microorganisms are absorbed onto the matrix, and here they can form complex communities, which can lead to um, biofilms. And the purification pathway of the water then can create these colonizable environmental niches, of varying nutrient richness, and in extreme environments can actually then help to promote certain cells. So we really do have to look after water systems. So that all comes down to the design and maintenance of water systems. So again, uh, you know, very crude diagrams on the screen, but it gives you a general outline of a typical pharmaceutical water system used to generate water of high purity or water for injection. So you have these different components, a brake tank, an activated carbon bed, a water softening column, deionization columns, reverse osmosis, distillation, then a holding system, a storage device, and then the distribution loop. So you can see we have to control all of these um, elements. And I'll put out a few of the elements of importance which are necessary for maintaining good microbial control. So we want to have a break tank, and this is an important requirement for pharmaceutical facilities. And its purpose is to prevent water that might have been contaminated during um, production from re-entering the drinking water supply because it creates the first of the colonizable niches. So the first point where biofilm might develop is around this area. So it's very important that we do control this through the break tank and um, any microorganisms coming in, this incoming water, the potable water, could um, attach themselves and start forming biofilms. We also have carbon beds. And this is kind of a matrix of finely divided charcoal, which is highly efficient at removing uh, some of the toxins you might be concerned about, the low molecular weight, organic materials and taking out any chlorine that might have been used to treat the water. Um, but it's important again that we sanitize these carbon beds regularly with hot water or steam and frequently replace them because otherwise we will get again the risk of biofilm formation. We also have water softeners and water softeners are required particularly where we have what's referred to as hard water. So if you're in a hard water area, this is where you wash a glass and you may get kind of residues on the glass. And that's because you have um, cations of calcium and magnesium present in the water. So you want to soften the water. Otherwise, 
you'll start to get into interference with deionizers and reverse osmosis systems. So here water passes through a resin filled column and the calcium and magnesium ions are exchanged for sodium ions, which serves to soften the water. But it's important that the resin matrix is well maintained because again, we can get biofilms. So there's often measures put in place like ultraviolet light in order to keep the microbial levels in control. Now there's various ways to deionize water. And this includes columns for electrodeionization and electrodialysis. Um, and the most common way is using charged resin columns. And again, we need to keep these in good check as well and to regenerate them using um, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, often of one molar, which is sufficiently biocidal. If we don't regularly, regularly sanitize, then we will have problems as well. It's also important. And again, there's another key feature when we come into cleaning validation is that our distribution systems, our overall pipe work is um, well maintained. And these should be designed so they have smooth surfaces, because if we have rough surfaces, then we are creating conditions for microbial attachment, which is another reason. And when we come on to rouging later, we really want to avoid um, rouging. And we need to have the best design, good quality pipe joints and good welds to keep smoothness. And we need to be sure that the water flows turbulently and rapidly. The continuous movement of water is a key mechanism for preventing microbial attachment. If the water's moving too um, slowly, then we do create conditions um, where microorganisms can attach. So rapid flow, rapid flow creates what's called shear forces, which help to prevent attachment. And um, we also need to avoid areas where water can remain stagnant and pockets of water can create um, biofilm risks when we get water flowing slowly. And this is where people talk about dead legs because here water can stagnate in branch points because the flow of the water um, reduces. We also need to have control over water storage tanks. And these are normally constructed from stainless steel and where they're used it's important to determine the capacity rate of use and frequency of flushing and make sure we're sanitizing the internal surfaces now regular water turnover is key to help in preventing contamination whereas slow turnover on the other hand helps to build up contamination so we don't want that and also to prevent microbial contamination from the outside air it's important that the vents on the tank are fitted with hydrophobic air filters and that we have, we test those filters regularly to make sure we haven't got filter occlusion um, or integrity problems. So I generally recommend testing these vent filters every, every six months and checking they're OK. It's also important with distribution of water that the ring mains are sloped, that means having a drop from the point of origin through to the point of return so that they are completely drainable and also we want to avoid leakage leakage is bad because it causes bridging of water to the external environment and then it's possible then for water from the outside to enter the water system and once you have external contamination in the water system then we do have um, problems and that applies to um, water distribution systems and also to the um, storage tank. Now it's possible to have cold and hot WFI systems. Personally I prefer hot WFI systems because we have a degree of self sanitization. So where we can maintain water for injection distribution under conditions of high temperature then this that's give us good control, but then we do have to have a cooling mechanism, often based on, on heat exchangers, to make sure that the when we're coming down to the point where the user wants to use the water, that we do have a good um, cooling mechanism in place. Well, we have cold water systems, so this would, this would be most purified water systems and 
some types of water for injection systems, um, then it's important that we do have some degree of control. So often these systems will have ultraviolet light, but in most cases that's designed to break down um, any chemical residues. Often the water isn't in contact long enough with the um, ultraviolet light. So we tend to use ozone or hydrogen peroxide as our key sanitization agent and then use ultraviolet light as the mechanism breaking down. We also need to have good control of our filters because I mentioned earlier we get fire burn build out by films forming then then our filter efficiency is substantially reduced and also as with water for injection systems we want to control our pipe work and our taps and hoses and so on so we're always getting smooth flow of water. And as I said about avoiding um, dead legs as well and it's also important to make sure that um, we don't have water that might be stagnant in valves particularly at direct user points and uh, where water is connected to equipment where we're running processes like clean in place or steam in place so they're just some important um, factors around control and also at user points it's important that we are using uh, tubing that is of a suitable hygienic design so this would involve tubing made from substances like polyvinyl chloride or chlorinated polyvinyl chloride polypropylene or similar plastics the transfer tubing should be drained after each use and hung up when not in use and ideally you should be changing this tubing every 24 hours to avoid microbial buildup. When you're using tubing, care must be taken to avoid splashback from sinks or recontamination from aerosols. The new tubing should, gen should have been sanitized before fitting, uh, ideally through autoclaving. And you want to give it a good flush before you actually um, connect it to a vessel or put into a vessel or however that tubing is used so there's some important measures there so just to wrap up uh, system design um, the design as you've seen can be highly influential on whether or not we're going to get microbial contamination and the size of the microbial populations and how we might remove and control that and the big the big things to avoid that i've mentioned are dead legs long pipe work runs into taps undrainable pipes, U-bends and so on, because they will all create microbial problems once installed. Okay, so that leads us nicely into cleaning validation. So what do we mean by cleaning validation? Well, we're referring to the evaluation and methodology that's applied to give us a degree of assurance that the cleaning process we apply can remo remove residents and contaminants from a piece of equipment or machinery. And these residues could be microorganisms, active pharmaceutical ingredients, other process chemicals like buffers, the cleaning agents themselves, detergents. And if we're doing things like aseptic process simulations, uh, media fills, we'll also have microbial culture media. So we want a degree of assurance that we can effectively um, run the cleaning process and also apply this consistently and we measure this against our acceptance criteria. There are different risks with different types of cleaning validation. So we have manual and automated cleaning validation and manual cleaning is inherently high risk. And there are some in the industry who will debate whether you can actually really validate manual cleaning. We still have to attempt it but you're known for when you've had to submit new drug applications, for example, that um, bodies like FDA really get very nervous about manual cleaning, but there was always going to be some need for some manual cleaning. And the reason everyone gets a bit nervous about manual cleaning is because there can be variations between different personnel carrying out the cleaning. You're going to get variations over time. I, I might spend half an hour cleaning something, but another person might only spend 20 minutes. How do you actually equate that in terms of how efficient was that cleaning? And you're also going to get variations in how much cleaning chemicals one person uses against another person. 
So you may need to carry out additional monitoring for manual cleaning to make sure you have a degree of control over the process. Now there's a number of GMPs that we can draw upon to give us guidance about cleaning validation. And we can turn first to the uh, FDA, the Code of Federal Regulations. So if you want to go and check up on cleaning validation GMPs, then have a look at part 111, current good manufacturing practice in manufacturing, packaging, labeling, or holding operations. And if you go to clause 27, it says you must maintain, clean, and sanitize as necessary, all equipment, utensils, and any other contact services used to manufacture, package, label, or hold components. We also have part 211, um, which has section 67 on cleaning uh, equipment and maintenance, and 820, which gives us our overall quality system regulations. In terms of Europe, then the European Medicines Agency and the Pharmaceutical Inspection and in Convention and Cooperation Scheme, the PICS, have their own guidances in place for cleaning validation. And these have a high focus on preventing cross-contamination, ensuring product quality, and minimising patient risk. And these guidances say, well, you've got to have written procedures describing how you're going to approach cleaning validation, as well as clarifying um, who is responsible for the exercise and what acceptance criteria you're going to draw upon. Uh, they also say within the protocol, you need to describe your methods of evaluation, your acceptance criteria, and how many runs you will be executing in order to prove that it's worked. Now, on the subject of number of runs, there is no firm regulatory guidance related to the number of runs, but by convention within validation, you would normally form at least three runs in order to demonstrate that the results from your cleaning validation are not due to chance, but are actually based on the capabilities of the system. So this gives you a degree of confidence that your process is equipped, is consistent and you're capturing all the variables. Now, if you have got different types of products, different equipment complexities, then you may need to do more runs in order to prove that these different combinations can all be addressed. And it's important that the methods themselves have been validated. So we'll look at method validation shortly. So there's a lot of literature around cleaning validation, but the area that has received less attention are the microbial aspects. So I'm going to focus on those um, mostly throughout the rest of the presentation. So important to the microbiological aspects are the microorganisms themselves, which present a direct hazard, and also the presence of residues. So if we have certain chemical residues and these have a degree of nutrients that can be provided, then these give a source for microbial growth. So should contamination be present, these can also pose a risk and they become a bigger risk um, the longer the um, hold period is. So we can refer to this as an indirect hazard. And to evaluate these microbial um, risks, we need a sound sampling plan. So the emphasis upon sampling is important since um, we can't, so unlike the chemical processes where we could use something like riboflavin and coat surfaces and then prove how well we're cleaning, what we can't do is deliberately introduce microorganisms into the manufacturing process because that creates a huge risk. So we're much more dependent from the microbial aspects upon using sound science to work out how we can get rid of the microorganisms and then we're sampling to evaluate whether we have actually got rid of the microorganisms. So arguably there's a greater emphasis on sampling than there is with the chemical aspects. Um, so we need to be concerned about the impact of microorganisms remaining post-cleaning and upon microbial survival. It's important within your facility that 
you have a microbiologist involved in drawing up the cleaning validation requirements. This might include evaluating the cleaning agents and the suitability of the different utilities, uh, which is water and also compressed air, because often we want to be drying down equipment as well. The, mic the microbiologist should also ensure that the clean room within which the equipment is held is also suitable. And this may involve looking for things like humidity control as well and temperature, because if we do have some residual organisms remaining or we get cross contamination, we don't really want to be in conditions that might help promote microbial growth, especially gram negatives or, or, or fungi. So the type of cleaning agent that we select um, will have different effects upon microorganisms. So the nature of the chemical and the types of organisms that we're most concerned about is of importance. So these cleaning agents are typically one that is caustic based um, or has alkali pH, so for example, sodium hydroxide. And then we may use one that is acid based as well, like hydrochloric acid. Many of these cleaning agents are also um, formulated with um, detergents in the addition of water, like a surfactant, for example. Um, so this might be uh, something that also helps clean as well as, as disinfect. Now, it's important to select these carefully because these agents are not typically subject to the types of disinfectant efficacy studies that we would use for our disinfectants for um, controlling clean rooms, for example. So we do need to do a scientific literature review to see whether they're suitable. Now, there is a recurrent discussion about the need for whether you need to use both an acid and a caustic for cleaning validation. Now, the advantage with the caustics, the alkaline um, agents, is that they're very effective at removing soils. So they can strip away oils, fats, proteins, starches and carbohydrates. And they're very good at microbial destruction and they destroy microorganisms by hydrolyzing the peptide bonds within the microbial cell. Um, so sodium hydroxide as it stands is, is very effective and also with the advantages of getting rid of fats and things like that as well. Um, with acids, um, the, so it'd be very rare just to use an acid. So what you tend to see is people using uh, just sodium hydroxide or they'd use sodium hydroxide paired with an acid. Um, now, the acids um, can be also particularly useful at removing protein residues. So something like phosphoric acid is particularly good at that. And they can also help to prevent uh, scale, lime scale, calcium buildup aluminium oxide and so on. Um, and they can also provide a secondary mechanism for eliminating microorganisms. So whether you need to use the acid will partly depend upon the outcome of cleaning um, validation and the particular soils that you want to be removing and your particular microbial concerns. So it's always a caustic, sometimes an acid. Now, it's important that, um, that we're also controlling other parameters that can influence the way that these um, agents are working. So we need to understand uh, what temperature and we know that we get better um, activity from um, antimicrobials at higher temperatures and less efficiency at lower temperature. So this is what's called the Q10 or, or, or the, the, the quotient 10. And also we can have pH. pH fluctuations can also serve to inactivate some of the um, way, that, the, the efficacy of some of the um, cleaning agents that we use. So it's important to control that as well. Another important element is with water rinses. So water using clean water, so this loops back to the um, aspects of the water system control because water is an essential part of cleaning validation 
water rinses will remove away cleaning chemicals and they also help to siphon away some microorganisms. Now microorganisms are found in two states in, in, the, in this context. They're either found in what's called the planktonic state, which essentially means free-floating microorganisms. So you think of plankton floating in the sea, for example. And then they're also found in the sessile state, which means attached to a surface. And if we can disassociate as many microorganisms as possible with our cleaning chemicals, then the water rinse can help siphon away some of these organisms. Water also helps keep soil suspended. So it's stopping the soil being reattached and creating another opportunity for microbial niches to develop and, and, and providing a nutrient source. It's also important with most aspects of cleaning validation that the final rinse water is water for injection. And this water meets the microbial specification that we discussed for endotoxin and for fire burden. It's also very important that following rinsing that equipment is not left with residual water because if left with residual water then we have the opportunity for microbial growth again. So the last step of the cleaning process should involve some form of drying and there's different ways to dry. We could apply 70% sterile isopropyl alcohol IPA or we could blow down with compressed air that's passed through a filter because where we have wet equipment we have opportunities for microbial growth and then the toxin concern where we have dry equipment that risk is substantially reduced. So cleaning validation involves um, both critical process parameters and critical quality attributes and these are terms that you appear, appear in a number of aspects of validation and pharmaceutical process control. So our critical process parameters when we're looking at cleaning validation could include time, dirty and clean hold times, process run times and so on, chemical activity, the exposure of the chemical, number of rinses and so on, the chemical concentration, temperature as well. Critical quality attributes may include water quality and the various tests that we put in place to show the water is the right quality the types of soil that we're concerned about, the nature of the soil, and the surface material and the surface quality. And we should also, particularly for manual cleaning, throw in the number of rinses and trying to get some consistency around those aspects of manual um, cleaning value. It's also very important that we undertake a thorough risk assessment when we're carrying out cleaning validation. And we should make sure that we are considering the worst case. So we need to look at things like stages of manufacturing, the type of soil in this, sort of residues, well, are we going to have protein residues, chemical residues, how much residue is there? What's the design of the equipment? How easy can we dry that equipment? The manual versus automated that we've touched upon. The surface material, it might be easier to clean a plastic compared to a metal or the other way around. The age of the equipment, as equipment ages, then you start getting um, niches, which could create further opportunities for microbial attachment. The equipment damage, um, and we want to avoid holding clean equipment in close proximity to dirty equipment, which is a, you know, a point I'll come back to later as well. Also with risk is that the level of cleaning that we want to undertake will relate to the um, stage of the process. So when we get right near the end of the process, we want to have the most thorough cleaning validation. If we're involved in sterile manufacturing, we want to have the most thorough. Early on, it may not matter as much. It's also going to be differences with sterile and non-sterile manufacturing and the equipment used for sterile manufacturing will undergo a further process. So we may well um, SIP or put the equipment into an autoclave as well. So um, there are different requirements as well that can affect that. Um, and we also need to consider within the risk assessment where microbial hazards might originate from. So we can have microbial contamination on the equipment um, after it's been used and before we clean it. 
We can have the effects of hold times prior to cleaning in relation to the risks of microbial proliferation and the release of endotoxin. We can cross-contaminate the equipment as we're holding it. We have the direct concern about the cleaning process to remove microorganisms and endotoxin. And we have the storage of the equipment um, prior to when we're going to clean it and after we've cleaned it. Cleaned it. And each one of these scenarios needs to be explored, considered and risk assessed. In terms of how you might run a risk assessment, there are different tools for that process. My personal favourite is the tool called HACCP. So this is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. And it's the kind of um, process you'd most commonly also use for environmental monitoring. So you're doing a process flow and you're pausing and you're looking at the different types of risks. So it's a combination of risk analysis, risk assessment, looking at where you can undertake risk mitigation and then considering where you might want to monitor to show that your system is continually in control. So I did mention earlier about worst case conditions. So in terms of worst case conditions from the microbial aspect, we're foremost concerned about what might support microbial growth and what might promote microbial growth. Um, and when we're running cleaning simulations, it might be that it may not be appropriate where we say artificially soil the equipment with riboflavin because this is a slightly viscous substance and may not present the worst case conditions for promoting microbial growth, then it might be that microbial culture media is also a better tool to use for cleaning validation. And I've also mentioned a few minutes ago about the different risks that clean and dirty hold times present. And we need to account for both of these when we're considering the microbiological risks. So the clean hold time is the time between the completion of cleaning and the initiation of subsequent manufacturing operations. So we should have an agreed time. We've cleaned a piece of equipment. How long can we leave it before we use it? Is that going to be 24 hours, seven days? How do we justify that? Well, we put something into the cleaning validation. And then there is the dirty hold time. So this is the time when we've finished using a piece of equipment and it's how long can we leave that piece of equipment before we clean it. And the longer that time is where there is a risk of soil, the more risky it becomes because we are going to get greater opportunities for microbial growth, proliferation and biofilm formation. So we need to have controls at both ends and input both of those into the cleaning validation matrix. Now, in terms of how we are going to assess microbial quality, we need to have well-defined test methods. And here we're going to have a combination of direct surface sampling, which is undertaken using swabs or contact plates. And generally, contact plates give a higher recovery. And also, we're going to have indirect tests, which are rinse samples. Uh, so with these tests, the, the surface tests tell us, have we got microorganisms left on the surfaces, particularly in hard to reach places? And the rinse sample tells us whether um, our final rinse is of suitable quality. And the use of rinse samples, the advantage is it allows a larger surface to be sampled. But the direct sampling methods are probably really the ones that are telling us whether we've got contamination. So rinse samples alone are not sufficient to verify the microbial status of cleaned equipment. So when we're looking to do this surface sampling, we need to make sure we are looking for worst case conditions. So either we're going to have equipment where it's pretty uniform and any case might present, any location might present the same case. You know, contamination could be transferred anywhere. Or more likely, we're going to have non-uniform equipment where we're going to have pipes and bends and needles and so on. So we're going to have certain locations they are going to be bigger risk than others. So when we're drawing up our cleaning validation protocol, then we need to put our sites in, justify our sites and assess our sites as being 
worst case. Um, also, it's important to bear in mind that obviously the swab is very focused or, or the contact plate, but we're looking for a small area. The rinse is looking for a large area. The swab is probably more indicative of what the worst case is in certain niches. The rinse gives us the average buy burden. And it often stands that a swab may fail, that a rinse may pass. But generally, if the rinse fails, most likely you also get a swab failing because you've got that source of contamination. Now, it's also important to bear in mind that with any microbiological method, there's a degree of limitation. You know, we have choices about how long we're going to incubate the samples for, the incubation temperature we select, which culture medium we've chosen, and also that swab recoveries are generally between 30 and 60 percent. We get far better recoveries with flock swabs than we do with plain swabs. Unfortunately, there's a global shortage at the moment of flock swabs due to uh, the number of coronavirus test kits that are being manufactured. Um, and also we've got the um, variable of attachment to surfaces, and we've got some organisms that just simply are not easy to culture. They might be too stressed, or they might be um, just not culturable at all, what's called the viable but non-culturable organisms. But we should take steps to qualify our media that we're going to use for the environment uh, for the cleaning validation. Um, and we also need to make sure that they, the, the media that we're using contains a disinfectant neutralizer, just in case we have residues of the cleaning agents still present. So it's a similar concept to um, monitoring clean room surfaces as well. We need to have that in there. And just looping back to the complexities around bacterial adhesion, um, this is why we need to have strong scientific methods because we do have bacteria adhering to the surface. It's not easy to um, demonstrate. So the same aspects of biofilms that I mentioned in general for pharmaceutical water systems are also points of concern within the pipe work or the equipment that we have for um, other aspects of um, core cleaning validation. And just to loop back as well as what I said about biofilm formation is that this aspect of bioattachment does occur relatively slowly. So we do have a window of opportunity when the organisms that are attaching to surfaces, going back to that concept that I said you get reversible attachment and permanent attachment. So if we process our dirty equipment relatively quickly, then we know we can hit the organisms in the reversible state. If we leave our dirty hold time too long, then we have a greater chance of biofilm formation. So time is a key factor that we want to be sure we are controlling. So that means minimizing time, segregating clean and dirty equipment, and making sure we are following our validated and controlled assessment. So how many microorganisms is a concern? Well, we're going to get differences here between sterile and non-sterile manufacturing. Um, so with non-sterile processing, um, the equipment's often not subject to another step. With sterile processing, it is often subject to another step. And um, we do need to have general indicators. So with the with the rinse sample, this needs to be of the same quality as the starting water. So if we're using water for injections, we know, remember what I said earlier, we have the buy burden maximum of 10 colony forming units per 100 mil and endotoxin limit of not more than 0.25 endotoxin units per mil. So that's the quality of our starting water. And we want to make sure that the final rinse is of the same quality. With surfaces, then often that level of 10 is used, particularly with sterile manufacturing. So we don't want to have any more than 10 CFU per square centimetre. 
from our swivel contact plane. But non-steriles, we can have higher levels. So the best approach that I, I found is there was a scientist called Doherty, and in 1999, he issued a very interesting paper that was published in Pharmaceutical Engineering. And he said, look, you have a look at the permitted microbial levels in the finished product, and then you work backwards to determine um, what you might have in terms of permissible levels in your um, uh, equipment that you're trying to clean with the cleaning validation. And generally, Doherty's process can be adjusted to a universal value of 25 coliform units per square centimetre. And there's also some interesting work by LeBlanc, which um, comes to similar levels. Now, with any aspect of validation in the pharmaceutical context, you need to make sure everything is documented. So you need to have protocols and reports. So you need to define your microbial test samples, rinses, swabs, and contact plates. You need to have a diagram of where you're going to take the samples from. You need to have sampling SOPs. You need to make sure that personnel carrying out the task are trained. A checklist to make sure everything's been taken. Decide how you're going to transfer samples, how samples are going to be receipted in the microbiology laboratory, how they're going to be tested, make sure they're tested the consumables that are going to be used, the results and test limits, uh, make sure you're recording any deviations and make sure things have been signed off by a qualified microbiologist. Now, cleaning validation can present challenges. So sometimes we can find that it's hard to reproduce, particularly looping back to what I said about manual cleaning. Sometimes uh, even fully automated CIP systems don't always work, particularly where they have dead legs or we have problems with draining solutions. Sometimes we can get physical protein buildup and these residues cause challenges. Sometimes our cleaning place systems can fail over time. because We get things like block steam traps or our maintenance procedures are not as good as they should be. And sometimes also we can um, have issues where we get air liquid interface issues. So that's a particular challenge if we're trying to clean a bioreactor. Um, we can get the biofilm build up as well. And um, we can also have a problem from surface roughness. And this takes us to rouge formation. So rouging. So rouging is a steady chemical process that is always underway with all metallic piping systems that are in contact with water. Water is actually quite aggressive. It's a solvent and it will react with metal. It's always happening, but it will come to a point when it's um, happening too much and we get the rust appearing. And particularly with stainless steel, all stainless steel will corrode over time. And this happens as minor ingredients in the stainless steel were lost and the electrochemical potentials rise. And the, the, the kind of key thing is how fast is this going to happen? And rouging can produce particulates and it can lead to chemical deterioration of water quality and can lead to blockages in filters. And although it's not directly microbial, rough surfaces create extra opportunities for microbial attachment. Okay, so I'm coming on to the last part of the presentation. I just want to quickly look at why failures might happen. So when microorganisms are recovered in the final rinse water, then this often means you've got some surface attachment somewhere. And this might seem more that the chemical treatment was insufficient in terms of how long it was left in contact with different surfaces, or perhaps the chemical treatment is insufficient and insufficient antimicrobial properties, or perhaps the number of water rinses that you ran was inadequate. Where you get in microorganisms recover from surfaces, then uh, this might be the time you're leaving, so you're given opportunities for biofilms, or you've got too many organic residues left that are promoting microbial growth, um, or that. Um, you have dead legs and things like that that are presenting problems. 
Um, you also need to focus on opportunities for preventing recontamination, as I mentioned. So this is about the importance of drying again, uh, avoiding any stagnant water inside equipment, uh, because you've got this growth source and opportunities for cross-contamination, which are developing. And just to illustrate that, there's the classic microbial growth curve. So if you have wet equipment and you have a low microbial population, then bear in mind that gram-negative bacteria grow fairly quickly. And they grow through this process of finding fission, which means that they're doubling their cells. So E. coli will double around every 20 minutes, Klebsiella organisms every 40 minutes, Acinetobacter up to around 55 minutes, and Pseudomonas every 100 minutes. So you can see just after a few hours, you can have quite a big microbial buildup. And not only have you got numbers, they become harder to read over time. So the presentation has been based on um, three papers that I've written. And I'm quite happy um, to um, provide those to, to you today and have those distributed around um, uh, the PDA organisation. So um, if you're interested in those, then, then I can provide those um, uh, to you. Um, and then just to summarise, um, what I've covered in the presentation is water system control, water system design, cleaning validation from perspective, noting that this is often neglected too much, looking at some of the variables that lead to microorganisms surviving, looking at the importance of controlling time, thinking about different approaches you can take to remove or inactivate microorganisms, and also looking at things like um, recontamination and the variations that sometimes exist. So it brings the presentation to an end and happy to move on to questions and answers. Okay, thank you. So let's take the questions. There are several of them and let's see uh, how many questions uh, uh, we are able to take. So uh, let me read the first one. Uh, we have a routine EM surface swab monitoring for all equipment and data generated for OSD product. Cleaned and unclean study is done and period established. Even though it is needed to assess as part of cleaning, uh, is it needed to assess as a part of cleaning validation? It's a little difficult to understand this question. But I think what he is trying to ask is, uh, oof. no, I I don't know exactly what is the question okay. this because he's yeah. Okay, well I'll have a stab. I, th I think it's sort of um, I was talking about. I think um, it could be two things. It could be one about the importance of surface um, sampling. Um, so I'll just re-emphasise that point. Um, that um, you shouldn't just do rinsing and you shouldn't just do surfaces, you should do rinsing and surfaces. And then if the question was about should you regularly do this, um, microbial sampling can be quite invasive and can carry a risk because operators intervene in the process. Um, so um, it's important to establish its cleaning validation, iron out the variables and just do it as part of a cleaning validation exercise. I don't know if that answered the question, but there's two important points anyway. Okay, uh, here's the next one. Uh, for absence of indicator microorganisms parameter in uh, potable water, how much is the minimum volume of potable water sample to be tested? Is it 100 ml or can it be less? Um, it, it depends on the... Um, test method that you're um, using because there are now some um, rapid um, methods where you can use smaller volumes but if you're using um, two of the more classic methods so if you're using membrane filtration um, then I would say 100 ml is better because it's more of a representative sample and you have to think of the way that um, microorganisms are distributed in water so it doesn't follow normal distribution they're they're kind of following more Poisson distribution so you need a relatively large 
sample size. So if you're using like these selective agars, like you use cetramide agar for looking for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, for example, or there's the kind of um, uh, things like Colilert. So Colilert is a, is a commercial one, but it's um, essentially you take like 100 ml of water and you pour in a sachet, you incubate that and you're looking for a colorimetric reaction. And both of those would require 100 ml. So I think if you're using a standard method, um, I, I, I would always recommend going for the larger volume because it's a more representative sample. 100 ml, yes, that's right. Okay, uh, the action limits mentioned for purified water is 100 and for water for injection as 10. Uh, these are acceptable limits as per USP or EP. So what should be the action level in order to ensure control over said utilities? Okay, um, so they are European pharmacopoeia um, level. So the USP is a slightly different. So um, the USP um, doesn't give defined limits. It gives recommendations and it talks about risk assessing it for your own controls, whereas the European pharmacopoeia gives very, very strict um, limits. Um, I think it's good advice to use the European pharmacopoeia limits um, or, or lower, and by lower you can set a, an alert level. And I think if you're applying that into the USP context, then you won't ever be criticised, and um, particularly if you're receiving inspection. Uh, FDA and from uh, European Union uh, or UK MHRA inspectors. Um, whereas if you do go higher, I think um, you are at risk of all the different challenges that I spoke about as well. So, you know, you won't really know if you're getting a biofilm, you will struggle with your cleaning validation. So I think the European pharmacopoeia ones uh, for purified water and for water for injection are the appropriate ones to target. Great. Uh, next one. In which step of feed waters endotoxin is suggested to be tested in order to produce water for injection less than 0.25 EU per ml? Is it the feed of potable water, purified water or WFI itself? OK, um, I, I wouldn't test um, the, the feed water. Feed water is full of lots of microorganisms and there's going to be lots of endotoxin and your process, your initial purification stages will remove that. Um, I would test um, the water that immediately feeds the distillation units. So <coughs> assuming that purified water is feeding your distillation unit, I would take a sample periodically because your 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 distillation unit, you're still, excuse me, should be um, qualified to achieve a three log reduction of endotoxin. So if you want to produce water of 0.25, then you want to make sure your feed water is not greater than 250 endotoxin units. Um, and then you also need to test the WFI anyway. So you need to take a sample of the storage tank, and then you need to take samples of the supply to the distribution loop the return from the distribution loop, and then the user points that form the distribution loop. Uh, next one, uh, would you be able to comment on passivation frequency for loop systems of purified water and water for injection? Um, th there is no um, absolute passivation um, frequency because um, there are different so many different factors involved in um, the potential damage. Um, so, for example, I mean, uh, some purified water systems, the cold water systems, are use plastic piping. So, there's no concerns there. With um, stainless steel, uh, generally, cold water um, systems um, rouge at a lower frequency than hot water systems, but hot water systems are better for microbial control. Um, so the trouble is you can only really establish this through experience and with regular monitoring. But as a rule, if I had a new system, then I would begin to be concerned after about five years. 
But if I looked at five years and didn't see any rouging, then I'd probably go to a two year inspection. And then on the first signs of, of seeing rouging, then put in place passivation or, or electropolicing or whatever was needed to do that. And if you end up with extreme amounts of rouging, you then have to go into pipe work replacement. Uh, next one is about uh, tank and draining. Uh, does the water system or tank need to be drained periodically or routinely? Do you need to drain it? And if yes, should it be completely empty, completely drained? Um, theoretically, if the water system ran continuously and nothing ever went wrong with it, and you had high turnover of water, then you wouldn't need to drain the tank. However, um, water systems are always undergoing um, maintenance or you want to add additional water outlets to the system or you need to change valves and so on. And every, <coughs> every action that ingresses into the water system, if you cut through any pipe work, replace any pipe work, change any valves, um, all these kind of activities introduce a considerable microbiological risk particularly of getting organisms into the system of biofilm and endotoxin. So you need to sanitise the water system. And part of the step of sanitising the water system is draining and filling the tank. So it should be a complete drain. And I would also do that exercise a minimum of three times as part of the sanitisation procedure, which I know when you come to have conversations with your production managers, they will be they will tell you how much how expensive that is and how much water injection costs but three times in my experience is important for controlling the microbial contamination for the sanitization step great uh would you be able to comment or recommend uh, that what kind of water should preferably used for final rinse of equipment in, uh, in the process of cleaning, you know, considering the cleaning validation uh, results? Um, it would depend on um, whether you're a non-sterile or sterile products manufacturer. Sterile products, it would always be water for injection. The non-steriles um, then often purify water can be acceptable depending upon the relative control uh, you know, the, what's the quality of, of that purified water, but within sterols, um, you, you need it to be um, WFI quality, be primarily because you're going to have this um, concern with endotoxin and purified water is not endotoxin free water. So you want to make sure that um, you're getting in that final rinse um, water that's of that kind of WFI microbial standard. Uh, this is about surface roughness. Next question. Uh, what role does surface roughness play uh, in avoiding uh, biofilms? What should be the surface roughness value at the welds, welds and joints? Okay, so um, surface roughness um, is assessed um, by uh, something called the RA value, and there's an ISO standard um, for this. Unfortunately, I can't remember the uh, number of the standard um, off the top of my head. Um, and the um, RA values, it, it's a dimensionless um, unit, um, but it is based upon the degree of smoothness. So one of the differences between um, different grades of stainless steel so um, it's why like if again if you're involved in sterile manufacturing you'd go for the 316 L grade of stainless steel above the 306 grade of stainless steel because it's um, smoother better better polished um, so the um, higher the RA value the um, better and you want to apply the RA value um, you'd apply to pharmaceutical processing equipment to pipe works. I can't remember off the top of my head what that RA value should be, 
but um, if anyone wants to um, drop me an email, I, I can look that up and uh, I'll, I'll reply okay. to that. No problem. Uh, now, is cleaning validation required after media film run? If yes, what method should we follow to estimate media residues? Um, well, the answer to that one, yes, it should, because I've seen um, three, I think three FDA warning letters um, about lack of cleaning validation after media fill runs. And the concern there is that you have a growth promoting substance, you have residues of that growth promoting substance potentially on the filling line, which could pose a risk for the next fill in terms of providing a microbial growth source. And also depending on the type of product you manufacture and where you get your culture media from, um, then there is also the risk of prions as well. Uh, so you could get uh, TSEs presenting a risk um, to the process. Now, um, so you can establish like standard cleaning validation for the vessel that's held the media. Um, so you can do all your usual aspects around that. In terms of actual filling line, well, ideally um, you'll, you'll be reprocessing the filling needles and stopper bowl um, or using disposable manifolds. So you can apply standard cleaning validation to that. In terms of residues on the actual line, um, then you're into a little bit more science-based risk assessment because it's not easy to um, you'd apply detergent and then um, disinfectant and you'd have to then use a degree of um, selective microbial monitoring potentially the use of contact plates and um, and so on to make sure you haven't got any residues but yes it, it is an important point that when you run a media fill that you do need to be satisfied you don't have any culture media residues and as I said that is a point that's been picked up by regulatory agencies. Okay uh, next one is about manual cleaning you mentioned your apprehensions and how manual cleaning is not scientific and how it can uh, give rise to a lot of problems but if someone yes. uses machines uh, which gives uniform flow and temperature will manual cleaning still be a very great concern for regulators? um it's less of a concern um it's, it's really about looking for the variables and controlling as many of those variables as time so if you can show to the regulator yes we've got things in control then um they're, they're going to be happier and it kind of depends on different degrees of manual cleaning so if you have a uh something to be to be cleaned you know it's saying that um, you know we have the water flowing at a certain level. We have a check to make sure we're using the right chemical. We um, <clears throat> will use everyone will use the same type of scrubbing brush if, if that's what's required. And you'd say in the procedure, staff must scrub for five minutes. They will then apply the chemical at this concentration and they will leave it for ten minutes. And then they will apply a uniform level of water to rinse it for five minutes. And you have all those factors in, in control, then you're in a much stronger position. And I think it's because, you know, I, I could, um, you know, it's like, it's like washing up a, when you're washing your dishes. Um, you might do it differently to your wife or the wife might do it different to the husband. We will do it differently. <laughs> like get, you've got to control it. So. That's the key thing. That's right. That's right. Uh, now, this is about flow rate. You know, you, you talk a lot about biofilm formation. So, what should be the, you know, if you can comment, if possible, on what should be the ideal flow rate of water to avoid biofilm formation? Is it possible to comment on that? Yes. Um, so, you need to have good turbulent flow. And there is, again, a dimensionless unit to assess that which is called the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is the um, degree of velocity of flow through pipework. And again, the higher the Reynolds number, the better. Off the top of my head, I think that's 7,000. But again, um, if anyone wants to tell me specifically, 
I will check that and verify that. But that's an important measure because um, you can have that nice flow. Now, this is where the problem of dead legs comes in. So as a pipe branches and runs down, what you've got to make sure is that that flow rate is the same at the branch point as it is through a straight piece of uh, pipe work. Because it's been shown, if, if you've got microorganisms being carried in that flow of water, when you're at the right level, they cannot attach the surfaces because of this thing called the shear forces. But when you get a branch, the, the rate of flow, if it slows down, it only needs to slow down by a little bit and you've got the opportunities for the microorganisms to, to pull and gives them that opportunity to attach to the surface. So I, I will, I'll check the number, but um, that's a really important point is that that flow rate has to be above a certain level. You've got to keep that velocity flowing. Stagnant water is always bad. Okay, now there are several questions and we will not be able to take all. So let's take the last one. Uh, this is about, uh, if you can comment about limits, uh, acceptance limits, you know, what should be the criteria? Uh, you know, what should, what, what should be the guiding philosophy? What should be the principles used? for bacteria, fungi, yeast, and endotoxin? Okay, um, so sterile products always is WFI. So the rinse should be WFI quality, and the levels is a total count for um, surface attachment. So um, you really don't want to see any more than 10 organisms per square centimeter of whatever surface you've um, sampled. And I so said the rinse water needs to be not more than 10 CFE per 100 mil and not more than 0.25 endotoxin units. For non sterile products, um, you really need to work out what is the acceptable by burden of the finished product and uh, kind of work backwards, um, trying to determine well, okay, if my vessel is contaminated, it's got a certain level of microns on it, what might end up in the finished product? So there's, you can either use a formula. Or a lot of people tend to adopt 25. So they say, I don't want any more than 25 organisms per square centimetre on my surface. And I don't really want any more than 25 organisms in my rinse water. And that's total count. So it's irrespective of bacteria and from you that you add them together and look at the total number. Great. Thank you so much. So uh, Dr. Tim, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. You've taken a lot of efforts. This is your second presentation. We really appreciate your presentation has been appreciated by last time also and this time also by all the people.